Listen now to an excerpt from book one of the Whispers of Spitfire series by E.S. Wynn. This is the story of Wind Spark and of the Sun Elk. I am six years old when my father dies. With no parents and no family closer than cousins within the tribe, I can only watch as the sacred elders lift him toward the stars with their black stained and glittering hands. I know I shouldn't feel ashamed that I had no part in weaving the funeral bed from sacred reeds and medicinal flowers. I'm too young, the elders say. Too young to carry my father's corpse to face the stars. Too young to build the bonfire that will receive his earthly remains and keep his flesh safe from possession by spitfire, by the great God that built our world from the bones of the last. All that we are comes from the stars, one of the elders whispers, and the others echo her with their own voices. I recognize the first among them, the strongest voice, and know that it comes from Sorza's falcon. Her craggy face is lined with the sacred marks made with the blood of gods, with the blood of our god, the one we call Icus, greatest of the sun elks. The three descending lines on her chin are the darkest, and I swear that when she looks at me, I can see the stars in those lines, in her amber eyes, in everything, just as she says. Even Icus comes from the stars, soars as Falcon continues, speaking the words into my soul as if they are meant only for me. The shards that shine forever overhead, the stars that remember all of the stories of the world as it was and of the world as it is now, the shards, the stars, and all the pictures that they paint to remind us when we might forget who we are, where we come from, and why we must hunt our gods. I try not to cry when the elders rest my father's bed on a stack of prepared wood and twigs stripped of bark. I try not to cry, but the tears run freely anyway, and when soars as Falcon looks back at me, I refuse to meet her piercing eyes. The other elders recite ancient prayers to the ancestors among the stars, but none of them even breathe the name of the great god Spitfire for fear of summoning him into the skin of my father's corpse. The sacred elders are his chosen, touched by his voice, but in this one ritual, the death ritual, they turn their backs on him as if he'd never broken and remade the world. What do you know of your mother, Windspark? Soars as Falcon asks me, settling beside me as the other elders lose themselves in chanting and singing. I stay as strong as I can, face her as she starts to stroke my hair. I have no answers for her. Nothing verbal, just a shake of the head. I know that my mother died in childbirth. I know that my father hated me for it, even blamed me for her death. I know that my mother was loved, and that she was born of a different tribe than myself and my father. She was a young shaman, Sorza's falcon pushes a frond of hair out of my eyes, then looks into me, stares almost as if she could look beyond me and see the past unfolding out before her just on the other side of my mind. She was an orphan, like you, until her elders took her in. She was of the Vitsena tribe, those who follow the great mother Skywolf in their rites. There's a pause, before I can find words, before I can respond. Soars as Falcon runs two fingers down my right cheek as if tracing lines there. She had marks here, twin lines drawn in Vitsena's blood. I taught her the ways of our tribe, told her the stories of Icus, and she told me of her tribe's ways and tales in return. Soars as Falcon blinks, and her eyes are as sharp and focused as ever. Would you like to know what she told me? I breathe, hesitate then finally force myself to nod. Brave, she says as she stands, towering above me. Behind her, the other elders click flint against shards of steel stolen from the gods, and soon my father's funeral bed is blazing, 
a halo of fire framing sores as falcon in the flailing light. I think you have the makings of a shaman, like your mother, she says. Come to me later. Bring what you will of your father's belongings to the cave of the elders tonight. His tools are yours now, and there's a future for you among the shamans of our tribe if you think you are made of stern enough steel to take it. At six, I don't know what I'm made of. Stars? Steel? I think about the oily black marks on the faces, hands, and arms of the elders, and I imagine what it might be like to wear those marks, to wear the same marks that my mother wore. When Sorza's falcon turns away to lead the other elders again, I trace my cheek in the same way that the elder did, let my fingers linger on tear-wet skin. All of the fires of the world are echoes of the great fire, Sorza's falcon shouts to the rest of the tribe, throwing her hands in the air above my father's funeral pyre. All people are echoes of the great first one, just as all elk are echoes of Icus, the great elk who holds the sun in his antlers. The blood of our ancestors lives on in us, even as their voices rise to whisper among the stars and stir us in the stories we tell. Fathers of all, mothers of all, no loss is forever. We will hear your voices again. The funeral for my father stretches on through the coldest parts of the night. Elders sit around the fire telling stories from the stars until only embers are left of my father in his funeral bed. Others of our tribe come and go at intervals, some retiring early, others coming late into the night to pay their respects, and to hear a few tales of older worlds, especially of the last world, before Spitfire came before Spitfire broke the shining cities and used their ashes to build the world we know. Near the end of the last world, everyone was a shaman, Sorza's falcon looks at me as she tells her story to those gathered around the fire. They were marked, like us. She pulls back a sleeve and shows the intricate line work cut in shining black on the underside of her arm. Their gods were many, and gave their brightly colored blood freely, seeking to enlighten everyone. No one ever died, or grew old, or got sick. All the secret knowledge was known to everyone, and the shaman race of the last world spoke freely with the stars, and with all the dead that came before. And then came Spitfire, another elder says. I know him, recognize him as sits with lions, a warrior with a proud past, who took the rights to become a shaman after one of his legs was mangled during a god hunt. His blue eyes are so icy and steely that I cannot help but shiver and look away when his gaze passes over me. The ancestors of the last world were not all of one tribe, though the gods of that world tried very hard to make it so, Sorza's falcon adds, placing a hand on sits with lion's wrist in a gentle, silencing gesture. Spitfire was called into our world by a tribe without shamans, a tribe that believed we should not bear sacred marks upon our skin or talk to our dead. Spitfire, the devourer, another shaman says, a bald and black-scalped elder called Mouse. Mouse rocks gently as he speaks but does not stand, does not look at anyone, only seems to lose himself in the intricate designs etched across his gnarled hands. Before Sorza's falcon can speak again, he whispers, Spitfire, the Dissolver. The tribe without shamans tied Spitfire to a mountain with sinews they pulled from the sun and tortured him. Sorza's falcon spreads her fingers across the sky, as if she could thread them through the stars and tie the night together. When they finally cut the sinews and set him free, he was so angry that he stomped and roared and howled until the whole world broke apart. Many people from many tribes died, and the shamans could no longer speak to the stars or to the dead. Spitfire was so angry that he devoured all the gods, and even devoured the sun itself, leaving the world in cold darkness. When he finally calmed, the world was empty and dead. The tribe that had tortured him was gone, and the few shamans of that time who still lived were scattered and frightened. 
In the great darkness, it was Spitfire who spoke to them, who guided them together, and who rebuilt the world for them. A new sun was planted in the sky from a seed of the last world's sun that Spitfire picked from his teeth, and as light returned to the world, even the stars began to speak our stories again. But all was not well, sits with lions rumbles. There's a long silence where the other elders watch him as he pokes the funeral fire, stirring the embers. Spitfire rebuilt the world because of guilt, not because of kindness. He had ideas about how the new world should be run, and he was afraid of being tortured again if our ancestors became too wise or too strong. He spoke to them and filled their minds with so many voices that they could not think of anything but eating and mating. The shamans heard him the loudest, and many became unable to think at all because of all the noise he roared into their ears. There was one shaman who could hear past the noise, soars as Falcon smiles, holding up a single finger. She was the first to teach others how to hear and how to think calmly, even when Spitfire roared his loudest. It was she that first took Spitfire's blood to mark herself, as those that came before had marked themselves with the blood of their gods. In doing so, she gained a kind of hold over him. Mother of shamans, Mouse whispers in the pause. His hands tremble, seem to glitter in the firelight. Mother of new gods. Soars as Falcon nods at Mouse, reaching out to touch his face. With childlike eyes, Mouse looks up at her, stares as she continues the tale. For many snowy nights they struggled together, Spitfire, and the first to take his blood. Soars as Falcon speaks as if speaking to Mouse, as if they are the only two people in the world. Each night, Spitfire grew stronger and more angry. By the eighth night, he was so ferociously angry that Mother of Shamans thought he might break apart the world again. But instead, he turned all of his rage inward and broke himself. With a great crack of thunder, he tore himself apart, and all the gods he had eaten came rushing out of him into the new world. These were not the gods of the old world, though, sits with lions, looks around the fire, lets his stare linger in the eyes of anyone who dares not to turn away. The many nights they had spent in Spitfire's belly had changed them. Their colorful blood became dark, dark as the blood we mark ourselves with today. Our gods, the new gods, like Icus, Urson, Vitsena, and all the rest, no longer seek to better our lives and enlighten us. They are wild, feral things now. They are their own masters, forever touched by Spitfire's darkness. But they are gods still, and must be respected, especially in the hunting and the killing. In the red light of the dying embers, I see Sorza's falcon as she looks at me again, continues as if speaking directly to me. It was Mother of Shamans who taught the first of our ancestors how to hunt and how to mark ourselves with the blood of the new gods. In her life, she was marked with the blood of eight of the new gods. And the stories about her achievements are many. She never lost touch with the voice of Spitfire. And even today, he whispers many secret things to us as shamans, while he slumbers as a memory among the stars. The night of the funeral is the last night that I spend in the hut I had shared with my father. The bed of firs and reeds that once kept us warm no longer seems capable of keeping out the cold, and it makes the decision to join the sacred elders all the easier to make. In the morning, I gather my father's collection of bone-carved animals into a hide sack with all of my clothing and every piece of smoked meat I can find in the hut. Fish hooks, hammer stones, and a knife go into another sack, all separated by a pair of furs that my father had planned on sewing into coats. Most of it, I only have a vague idea how to use, but it feels foolish to leave anything behind. Soars as Falcon is waiting for me at the opening to the cave of the elders when I arrive. I watch her as she stands, half expect her to chastise me for coming at dawn instead of during the night, but she wraps me in her warm cloak of feathers instead, holds me close, and warms me as if I were her own child. I leave the sacks of my belongings at the threshold as she ushers me into the firelit darkness, shows me a world that only shamans ever see. 
the underworld, the cavern where the sacred elders sing alongside Spitfire in the endless night. For the next six years, I learn the ways of the gods. Soars as falcon, mouse, sits with lions, and all the rest of the sacred elders teach me to see the stories in the stars, teach me the tales that our tribe has passed down since the birth of our world. I learn the stories, the sounds and the shapes that give life to every secret gallery of every sacred cavern along our migratory route. By the time the elders call for our first god hunt in nearly ten winters, I can name every god painted on the walls of every sacred cave, even the ones that have not been seen since the world was new. At twelve, the elders bring me out into the village to face the rites of adulthood. Standing before the entire tribe with half a dozen others my age, I watch as the sacred elders stoke a massive springtime bonfire to life, then smother it with woven mats of green and fragrant flowering plants. The smoke is fanned over us in a cleansing rite that we are told to endure stoically. When the flames finally break through, consuming the mats, and the great plumes of smoke clear and reach skyward again, there is a young elk lying on her back before us, dazed and tied at the ankles, her eyes rolling, breath coming as a raspy panting. Sits with lions, seizes the young elk by a cheek, and several hunters nearby catch her legs, pin her down as the shaman whispers into her upward-facing ear. The words are quiet, but I catch the details. No, he is telling the elk why we have caught her, and why we must kill her. Her body will nourish ours, and her blood will carry the ready young into adulthood. Sits with lions as quick with his knife. His blade is a shard of steel cut from a scale of stolen god hide, and it slices deep and easy. The blood of the elk runs across the ground, and then Mouse is squatting beside Sits with lions, trading the other shaman's steel blade for a branch cut from a juniper tree. The short needles wick up the warm blood like the bristles of a paintbrush, and then sits with lions, turns toward us, begins to tell a story as he brushes our faces and chests with the blood. In the last world, there were no rites of adulthood, sits with lions, says. The race of shamans that lived in the shining cities of the distant past had no need of them, for they were born fully formed, as pure and as simple as children, and the gods made certain that no harm ever came to them. For the ancestors of the last world, there was no pain, there were no tears, they never felt heartbreak or loss, they were safe from all harm, and never knew what it means to need, like an infant always kept close to its mother's breast. The needles of the branch slap my cheeks and leave a lingering scent of elk and juniper in their wake. The blood is warm, quickly cakes against my skin. Besides sits with lions, soars as falcon, watches the ritual with a smile, spreads her arms to the sky, and picks up the tail where the other elder left off. Mother of shamans was the first of our tribe to perform this ritual, soars as falcon says, addressing all of us the young at the edge of adulthood. But this ritual was not her creation. Voices from the distant past, the dead of the world that came before our last, they spoke through the stars and taught Mother of Shamans all of the rituals we still perform today. These were their rituals, but even they did not create these ways. These rituals go back to the beginning of everything, to the dawn of the first world and the awakening of the first people, before male and female were cloven from each other, when we were only echoes of trees, and the great first goddess gave us the breath to become as we are today. Sits with lions, tosses the juniper branch into the fire. The young elk has been carried away by hunters who will clean her and prepare her for the fertility feast on the other side of night. Other adults from other tribes, all newly made in similar rituals, will be drawn in by the great plume of smoke put off by the spring bonfire, and before the moon is full again, some among my number will already be married. Whether they will stay with my tribe or leave to join another will depend on agreements made between parents. How many we will gain and how many we will lose still remains to be seen. Either way, those left will join the hunt to slay Icus, 
when the elders decide that the time is right. Those left will taste the blood of our God and hear the voice of Spitfire, even if only for one night. Come, Sorza's falcon addresses us. As the newest hunters, carvers, and weavers of our tribe, you will be the first to eat tonight. A proud elk with great antlers has been prepared to hold you until the rituals of mourning. His meat is fatty and rich. She grins at us. He will make you strong, and he will make you fertile. Several of the blood-smeared, newly made adults chuckle and tease each other. But I remain quiet. The god hunt is all that occupies my mind. Learning the knowledge within the blood of Icus, becoming one of the sacred elders, and hearing the whispers of Spitfire, it's all just within reach. Soars as falcon must sense it in my gaze, for when I meet her stare, her eyes glitter with a certain excitement. I have no interest in taking a husband or a wife. There is only one road I seek to walk. Caring for a family would only hold me back. The nights rise and fall away with the dawn and the light of the sacred sun. Young adults are married off and our tribe gains three new hunters, each from a different outer tribe. One of the newly married additions is from Vitsena, those who follow the mother Skywolf, and I trade so many stories with him about the gods that his wife starts to watch me with a certain wariness, as if I might be a threat to their newly budding marriage. The other two know almost no stories of their gods. One is from a tribe called Frey, for the Iron Lion they track through the mountains in the far north. The other is from a tribe that follows and hunts a serpent called Gunder. A pair of young hunters chosen for their speed and skill in tracking are sent by the sacred elders to seek Icus, and when they return, it is night. The moon is still bright even as it wanes away from full, and the noise of the hunter's return wakes me from a dream of ice and shadows that I'm happy to leave behind. When I cross into the entryway of the sacred cave, I see the two young hunters chattering with sores as falcon, planning the hunt that will earn me the sacred marks of a shaman. Two days' journey for the tribe, Sparrow Dance says. She is the youngest of the two hunters, and the most visibly excited as well. The other, a green-eyed teen called Snake Upon Stone, nods firmly and lets Sparrow Dance explain the details. Icus walks in the forest north of here, turning the trees and the mud exactly as you said he would be. And the antlers sits with Lioness, folding his robe under his knees as he takes a seat beside Sorza's falcon. Full of sun, Snake Upon Stone grins, miming the wide horns of the great elk with his hands. Blinding. The hide? Sorza's falcon asks. Solid iron, no black. Sparrow Dance nods, breath catching. She knows what that means. We all know what it means, but she whispers the words anyway. He is mature. We break camp and head north at dawn, soars as Falcon turns and looks at me, meets my eyes with a smile. It has been nearly ten winters since we have slain our god. We have a shaman to mark, and rituals that require the blood. Her smile spreads. It is time. Sits with lions, pulls his robe closer, as he looks at me. But I can see from the light in his eyes that he agrees. It is time. It's been time for a while.